Spooky season is quickly approaching, and though I haven't worn a Halloween costume in many years, I saw that some people on Costube were doing a historical Halloween collaboration, and I just knew that I had to jump on in. So I'm gonna be making a Halloween costume from about 100 years ago, though I won't show you which one just yet. You'll have to watch my next video to see which one I decide to make. To start with, I wanted to make sure that I had the approximately correct undergarments to wear underneath my 100 year old Halloween costume. So I'm gonna be making a step-in teddy from the 1920s. The pattern is available for free online and I'll leave a link in the description so you guys can follow it as well. And I believe it's actually from an original 1920s magazine. I will admit that I tried to do some research to figure out exactly what would be historically accurate to wear as undergarments in the 1920s, though I am still a very much a novice in the 1920s era. What I can say from what I've looked at is that it seems like the 1920s were a time of rapid change in undergarments, and so it seems like there's many different options for what you can wear as undergarments. This actual pattern also mentions that if you make the particular teddy from a thick enough material or heavy enough material, you can wear it as the only undergarment, even though in the 1920s it was still pretty common to wear more than one layer. But this will be the only one that I'm going to wear. Is it particularly historically accurate? No, I chose fabric that I think is slightly too light for that, but I still really wanted to make an underlayer that was somewhat reminiscent of the 1920s underwear that would be worn. Moving on to what I'll be talking about this time is how to actually make this 1920s teddy. I first came across this pattern in Gwen's video, so you can please check her video out. It's on Gwen's shenanigans, and I really love that at the end she kind of added a pretty detail of embroidery to the top and I wanted to bring some fiber arts into mine so I have decided to make a crochet yoke around the top of my teddy. Crochet yokes are something that I've come across a lot in my online antiquing adventures. They seem to be pretty common from around the Edwardian times to about the 1920s. You can buy just the yokes themselves for corset covers or nightgowns, or you can actually find original 1920s teddies. They look a little bit different than the pattern that I'm doing, but they're still 1920 teddies that have these particular crochet yokes around the top. However, the typical yoke of the time is straight across the top, whereas the costume that I'll be wearing has a slight v-neck, so I do need to find a yoke that has more of a structure that is appropriate for a v-neck. I did manage to find a filet crochet chart that does have kind of a v-neck top, so that's the one that I'll be using in order to embellish the top of my teddy. This is my first time working with filet crochet, so please wish me luck as I work on making this 1920s undergarment. This teddy is constructed from three pieces of fabric, one for the wraparound portion of your body, two for the front and back skirt flaps, and then I will be adding the filet crochet yoke to the top. The pattern doesn't come with any pieces to cut out or trace, just directions on how to measure yourself and then cut and assemble the pieces in order to create this garment. The first measurement you have to take is the widest circumference across the top of your bust. For me, that is around 35 and a half inches and then adding an inch on each side for folding over the seams. The second measurement is from your bust to your hips, and this will be the location on your hips where the bottom skirt portion will start to flare out. One thing that I didn't do and I would highly recommend that you do is making sure that however low you make your skirt fall, that you also measure that the 35 and a half inches or whatever your bust measurement is will fit you around that portion of your body as well, since the top is basically just a straight tube down between your bust and that hip point. I'm also kind of sketching out the filet crochet yoke that I will be making to kind of figure out exactly what shape to make it and the dimensions, which will also be 35 and a half inches along the bottom edge with the two top triangles ending right at the front side. So approximately halfway across. I began by making the crocheted top edge, just one triangle to kind of get the sizing right. For this, I'm using number 50 size crochet thread, which is the smallest crochet thread I have ever worked with, and a 0.6 millimeter crochet hook. This is also incredibly small. I decided on this particular size just because I tried out a few different versions of the filet crochet and it looked best with this particular sized hook. The pattern originally calls for number 70 thread, but 
that would be even more difficult for me to work with. So I started with number 50. I didn't show the process of me making the first triangle in this filet crochet yoke at all because to be honest, I had a lot of false starts, restarts, redos, ripping back. It was a huge process to finally get to this point, but I feel like I learned a lot in making just this first triangle. I wanted to make the triangle first to kind of understand how big it would be and if the sizing would be appropriate and kind of hold it up to the top of the rest of the teddy to make sure that I understand understand how much wider to make it to reach all the way from the front of the teddy around to the back and side of the teddy. So in order to understand how much more I needed to crochet in the width, I actually cut out the top parts of the teddy. I used the measurements that I had previously written out. So that is 37 and a half inches wide and 16 and a half inches tall. As you can probably see, the cotton that I'm working with is very, very sheer. So if this would be truly the only undergarment worn, it should probably be a much heavier material to provide support and coverage and actual structure to the dress that you'd be wearing on top of this. But it's what I had on hand and I think it still works okay. I'm getting really excited looking at the top of the filet crochet that I've already worked up against the cotton of the rest of the teddy. I think it looks really fantastic and better than I could have ever imagined. And actually looking at the size of that particular triangle versus the rest of the top, I was a little worried it would be too small. But holding it up against my body, I think that that triangle ended up being the absolute perfect size. So now all I have to do is chain enough crochet loops all the way across to work eight rows of plain crochet down. And then on top of that, work the second triangle for the top of my yoke. After measuring out how many of those filet squares I would need to match the rest of the width of my top, I calculated how many loops I would have to make and it was over 400 in order to make the rest of the top of my yoke. I lost track of those loops very, very easily. So I came up with this method of marking every 25th loop. I wish I had better stitch markers, but all I had on hand at the time are bobby pins. So I had a lovely string of bobby pin crochet loops, but it helped me keep track of my over 400 chains that I needed to make. After making those over 400 chains, it was time to work back and forth. And this is just in those open fillet squares. This is to kind of make that wider band that'll go around the back of my top, as well as adding a little extra width to the bottom of the yoke in the front. The original pattern has the yoke coming to a point both in the front and in the back. But to be honest, it took me so long just to make that one triangle because it is incredibly fiddly for me to work with this size of thread and hook. So I decided to just call it at two of those points in the front and just leave it nice and plain in the back, even though that also took me a very long time to crochet. At this point, I am two of those open work rows in and I need to do a total of eight. I think I spent a few days on and off working on this because it is so time consuming to work across that many open work filet crochet squares. Of course, the moment that I finished all eight of the rows and I set it down in victory, I managed to spill coffee on it. That was kind of a heartbreaking moment, but I managed to get it straight to the sink and rinse off some of the coffee. And I think it's just a very light stain now that you can kind of see right here. But hopefully you can also see the general outline of what the yoke looks like now, where I have one triangle and then the entire width of the open work filet crochet. So all that's missing now is the second triangle to make up the rest of the yoke in the front. 
So while I worked that first triangle from the top to the bottom, the second one will be started from the bottom and then working up to the point, which is kind of interesting because I am looking at the chart now in a different way than I did the first time, which keeps it a little bit more engaging than if I had to do the exact same thing over again. Something I've realized when working in filet crochet is that tension is incredibly important. So you can see my tension is slightly different between the open work crochet and the triangle that I'm doing now, and that's causing a little bit of warping. I did find at the end that washing it and pressing it does take out a lot of that warping, but you do still see a sub of it at the end. So I still need to work on consistent tension if I wanna do more filet crochet in the future. Another thing that I find fascinating about working on these patterns is I feel almost like a printer, a 3D printer of a kind, as I'm seeing the pattern come up as I'm working right to left. It's like pixel by pixel, the picture builds itself up. I guess knitting and crocheting is a type of 3D printing if you think about it. Getting to this finished filet crochet yoke took me several days longer than I thought it would. This was such intricate, fiddly work, and you can definitely tell the difference in the tension that I had in the first triangle portion of the yoke versus the second. But hopefully once I wash and press it out, it won't be too noticeable anymore. I was also worried that the definition between the closed squares and the open squares wouldn't be super obvious, but now that it's finished, I think you can definitely see the pattern and design come through. I think I've mentioned this before when I knit some lace, but I absolutely love working on these open work patterns in the evening sunlight where you can see the shadows that it casts. I think it is absolutely mesmerizing. The last step of making this yoke is to add a border around the edge. I was going to make it more intricate than just one row of single crochet, but at this point I had already spent much longer than I had intended on this yoke and these stitches are so small. I think I need new reading glasses prescriptions because even with with them on, it, I was having such a hard time seeing where to put my hook. So I decided to leave the border at just one row of single crochets all the way around. After weaving in all the ends, I decided to block this yoke to make sure it is exactly the right dimensions. And when I was ironing out and pressing my yoke, I made sure that the edges were as straight as I could get them. And I tried to make the two triangles of my yoke match as best as I could, stretching and pulling where I thought it was needed. Now that the crochet yoke is fully finished, it's time to work on the sewing portion of the teddy. So that top portion that I was talking about before, that's 35 and a half inches wide, I ironed over a one inch seam on both the right hand and left hand sides. This will be where I attach the clasps to secure it on my side as I'm wearing the teddy. The top will also be folded down by one inch and seamed in place as well. Now, I am not currently in any of my usual locations where I have nice sewing machines, so I decided to buy a very inexpensive mini sewing machine. Is it the most amazing machine ever? No, but it does sew in a nice straight line, which is all I really need it to do. It is, however, quite loud, so I will spare you the sounds of it sewing. It is an incredibly noisy machine. <laughs> I am going to fold over the top edge of the teddy twice, a half an inch each time in order to make a one inch seam at the top as well. Before sewing, I like to press the seam down, especially since I'm using a not so great sewing machine to make sure things don't really move out of place as I'm sewing it down. 
Well, there you can see that I now have one inch seams both at the top and the right and left hand side of the top portion of my teddy. It is now time for me to attach the crochet yoke to the top edge. I debated a few different ways of doing this. I think the safest would have probably been to stitch it on by hand, but I decided that I just didn't have the time for that this week, so I'm going to actually stitch it on by machine. After a few false starts of sewing this yoke on, I think the machine ended up working pretty well. The only thing is, and something I should have monitored more closely, is that the foot ended up stretching out the top of my yoke. So while I had originally pressed the yoke to match exactly to the top edge of my teddy, it ended up being about an inch longer, which I just folded over, but it did mess with the final fit of the top yoke because the center of the yoke is no longer exactly in the center. It is slightly off. I did try it on just to make sure that it wasn't too far off and I do think that it still works quite well. I think the triangles are slightly wide for my figure. I think they'll fold over a little bit when I put my arms down, but I'm super excited to see how this filet crochet yoke works with the rest of my undergarment. Something else that I also made sure to check at this point is the length of my top because this is the point where the flounce will be attached and I knew that the yoke would be taking up some sort of space in the vertical direction. So I just wanted to make sure that I was still hitting the right points in terms of length of the top of my step in teddy and it's looking pretty good. In order to make the two bottom flounces, you're going to cut out a square that is exactly the same width as your top portion without the seam allowances. You want a square that's, for me, 35 and a half inches wide and 35 and a half inches tall. I just used the top that I had as a guide to cut out the right width, and then to make sure that it was a full square, I think I used a trick that I learned from making origami, which is taking the opposite corner and folding it over to match up exactly with the portion that I'd already cut, and then just cutting around that folded over line to make a nice square. Now I don't think it's 100% perfect, but I think that's a pretty close square. However, the bottom ruffles aren't actually two squares, it is a square cut diagonally across in order to make two triangles. In order to give myself a better guide, for where I would cut across diagonally, I folded it in half again and ironed it so that I would have a nice diagonal ironing line that I could follow with my scissors. Now again, my cutting job isn't fantastically perfect, but I think that I have two nice triangles for my bottom flounces. The directions at this point say to pico all the raw edges, and apparently picoing is a particular 1920s sewing machine finishing stitch, which my machine definitely isn't capable of. Maybe my 1920s finished machine that I have back at home might be able to do this, but I just decided to fold over the edges twice again in order to finish off the raw edges of the bottom of my flounces. Now you can see that the flounce is much wider than the width of the top, and you do want to gather in the center sections a little bit. You don't want to just straight attach your flounces. So visually, I kind of played around with how much of a hanging side that I would want to have to each part of my flounce, and then marked that on even sides and created like a nice wide basting stitch across the top so that I could gather between those two points to make it even with the width of the top. gathering down the flounce and spreading them out as evenly as I could across the width of the top of the teddy, I sewed that flounce to the bottom. At this point, I still had a few raw edges at the side portion of my flounces left over, which I decided to use a rolled hem to finish off. I followed a tutorial by Retro Claude on how to do a rolled hem, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic, so I will link a video to her instructions down below because it was incredibly clear and I learned how to do it very quickly, and I really love how my rolled hems turned out. 
After that last bit of finishing was done, my 1920s step-in teddy is complete. Am I standing on the roof of my building in 100-year-old underwear? <laughs> yes, I am. I hope that my neighbors didn't think I was too strange, and I hope that you can tell that I'm actually wearing a tank top and shorts underneath because it is quite sheer. As I mentioned before, I wish I would have taken a little bit more time to be a bit more careful with attaching the bottom flounces to my top, so I do want to redo that at some point because the points are not centered, and that bothers me a bit. I also want to futz around a little bit with the length of the top and exactly where the straps hit to make sure that it fits me more properly because right now you can see that it's kind of scrunching up and warping in strange places. I also think that I need a few more closures are along the side of my teddy because it is gaping a little bit, but these are all things that I can fix in the future and for right now I am just really happy with how it turned out and I can't believe that I have a historical undergarment that has a filet crochet yoke. It's something that I have always wanted. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to give it a like. If you want to watch more of this, feel free to subscribe as I will be releasing a video very soon of making a 1920s historical Halloween costume. I also have links in the description to the patterns that I've used, my other social media links, and some patterns that I've created myself. So feel free to check that out and I will hopefully see you again very soon.